this podcast, you will get a glimpse into my monthly mentorship group sessions where we are speaking about relationship attachment styles. I'm teaching the group and doing Q&A with some of the beautiful people in my mentorship group about our human attachment styles. I was drawn to this book some years ago because I didn't know humans had attachment styles until I read the book and I thought, yes, of course, I get it now. The book speaks about three distinct primary attachment styles all humans have that begin in nurture and in our early years. It's a fascinating subject. I hope you enjoy it and uh, it encourages you, gives clarity to your relational world perhaps. And uh, please let me know what you think. Send me a DM at Paul Scanlon UK. Enjoy. Thank you. Always felt part of my calling, I suppose, to use that language, um, is to be a crash test dummy for other people who are considering a similar collision in their lives that they anticipate they will have if they behave a certain way or if they are true to themselves, they expect, they expect certain collisions that they don't know if they'll survive. I feel for me to talk the way that I do about my life is me saying, I have just had the collision that you are scared of and avoiding and I survived, here's what I learned, is I feel part of what I'm supposed to do with my life. Because I think if you can find someone that has come through what you think you won't survive and has lived to tell the story, it inspires you to have a go yourself to some degree. That's why I think like-minded people more than ever right now around the world must find each other. Similar to you, Paul, I also have a secure slash avoidance relationship style. Yeah. But I'm wondering, like, how do we assess ourselves? And, and I'm asking in terms of this, like, I also am very sensitive towards um, how I can get overly attached to people and how they can influence um, my decision making skills. And so if they have a lot of sway in my decision making skills, I, I tend to kind of give a bit of space. Um, but at the same time, I, I know that when you talked about a secure relationship in terms of the babies, when the mother came in or when the mother or when the mother left, the babies were okay. But then I feel like there's a fine line between if the person's there or not in your life, you're okay. Because that could be apathy or that can be secure, right? So how do you make an assessment between like, are you secure in the relationship? Or are you just developing apathy to protect yourself? I think what they did in, in, in the book, they tracked with people um, into later life to see whether or not what they saw in a baby or a toddler remained in them into later life. And it showed that it was pretty consistent. So what I think I learned from that is that it can be defined as either, and you may feel very secure, but to someone else, they may interpret it as apathy, disinterest, rudeness, impoliteness, um, cutting someone off. I think secure people are prone to be interpreted that way by people that have perhaps a more anxious style of relating. I think I did a post some time ago because I got fed up with people saying to me over the years, I find you very intimidating. <laughs> and I say to them, okay, so am I intimidating or are you intimidated? Because there's a difference. Because I find you intimidating or I find you apathetic um, makes me feel I have something to fix. And I came to the point where, because I know, I, because I know it's, I'm capable of being intimidating, I always think I've got something to work on. And I came to a point years ago where I thought, no, I'm not intimidating. But I know how I've been intimidated by people. There's people that were in my life that I felt intimidated by, and I realized they were never going to change by me telling them that because they didn't know what else to do. And I thought, it's me that needs to grow up, become more secure. And I think with these relationship styles, Grace, I wonder if it's that mirroring thing that we've got to talk about. That if people say to you or say to me, I find you, you know, a bit apathetic relationally, it may be my way of saying, well, let me explain to you my secure relationship attachment style. Maybe it's that that you're picking up on is what I, is what I would want to reframe it as. Because I've come to a stage now where I think I can be prone to nuances of not doing it well. But I've settled into this is my sweet spot relationally now. 
but I cannot guarantee you won't see that um, in a negative light. All of these can be seen that way, I suppose. And there's parts of secure avoidant, of course, that anxious people are going to see as a threat. So I don't think there's any guarantees on it, Grace. You've got to know in your own heart whether you're being apathetic um, and detached in a negative way, or you're just very secure. My name is Grace, and I am from Jakarta, Indonesia. I have been part of Paul's mentoring program for about eight months now, and it's been a wonderful experience. Thank you so much for shedding your wisdom and your experience with us, Paul. I think um, it's really um, changed and shifted my perspective towards a new way of thinking, a new way of communicating with my team, and just a new way of um, being more aware of the way I personally think. Thank you so much. But if we have an avoidance style which drives us to distance ourselves from people that we regard as controlling, how do we avoid becoming controllers ourselves? <laughs> That's a great question, Sid. You know, one of my, one of my, I suppose, guarantees I won't be controlling is I hated being controlled for so many years. Um, I was in the shoes of the controlled. And when I woke up to it, and that's the thing, when I became conscious of it in all its subtle forms that are below the radar, because control can be framed as love and concern and compassion, and I know what's best for you, and trust me, when it's, when it's shaped that way by people you love and respect, control seems the wrong word to use, so I didn't. But when I woke up to it was exactly that, Sid, and how many years I'd lost and how it had locked me into this um, un insecure, clingy version of me and this dumbed down version of me and this afraid to speak out version of me. I think because I'm so aware of what that did to me, I am now probably paranoid is the right word about control. <laughs> when I meet it anyway, even on a phone with someone or dealing with some, you know, bureaucratic box ticking person, I just, you know, I'm not going to like calm down. It's like that with me. So I think I've gone the other way. So I know I can react because of how I felt control for years. So that's my guarantee or that's my, um, safety net for not being controlling to someone else. And I think all of us that can relate to a part of our lives or a relationship experience where we felt controlled, manipulated, coerced, and then go there and remember who you were at that time and how you hated that version of you. I think that's the only way we can find empathy to not pass that on anymore is what I think I did, Sid, and still do. We hope you've been enjoying the episode so far. We just wanted to let you know about the mentorship group, which Paul has been referring to. This is a tribe of people from all over the world, all different professions and walks of life that come together each month to discuss with Paul on different topics as well as Q&A and so much more is included in this. And we'd love to invite you to find out more about it. Visit thementorshipgroup.com or click the link in the show notes. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the episode. So my question is, in you kind of um, breaking free of that, establishing a new way of your being, regardless of relationship, regardless of work or setting, is there something in you that is like, just like non-negotiable? Like I won't work with you. I won't be part of that church. I won't be part of that organization. That's just like, I guess the dance between your calling, destiny, sense of wanting to do something, but then not wanting to like having such a strong boundary that you wouldn't be a part of something. Yeah, I think, all, I think all of this, Dana, for all of us has to have boundaries that will be different for you to someone else. And I think you have to have non-negotiables in your reinvention because other people have them for themselves. They're not, mm. They may not tell you that. They don't want you to have them, but they mm. want to have them. So I think I had to have non-negotiables for me which were to do with, I wouldn't be in their space. I wouldn't be in a car with them. I wouldn't be in the WhatsApp channel with them. I wouldn't go to the event with them. I wouldn't sit with them. These were my boundaries I created, I suppose. 
And eventually I started to be resistant and have a radar for the energies when the person wasn't around, their energy was still in the room. And I could see people in the room been affected by someone that wasn't in the room, but the energy that they knew that person would have towards what was being said. So now, we, now we're having a conversation about people that aren't even in the room who are dominating us that are in the room. And these became my non-negotiable boundary areas Mm -hmm. for me to stay true to this secure version of me rather than my anxiety about what they will think about what's been said in this room. So let's yeah. change the outcome to keep them happy would be my anxious me. Yeah, that's good. So do you feel too in the personal reinvention of even you in this last 10 years, actually becoming the healthier version of you actually changes the trajectory of what you do and how you function and even who you do life with like it oh, totally and, and it, i mean my trajectory that i began on this journey in the reinvention of the church 20 years ago yeah hundreds of people left my trajectory yeah. it's kind of been like that ever since really i feel i feel that i am a very polarizing um person and influence and energy but i think i've come to settle now it's part of my calling and so i want to do that well i don't want to be divisive rudely ignorantly or without care but my trajectory has made me be disruptive i suppose and i'm happy for that so yeah whatever you decide to become if it's not who people like if it's not the version of you they like then you're gonna have a trajectory away from them and you have to say it's a non-negotiable i am not going back in that skin anymore i'm not Mm -hmm. which is difficult to do if it's a marriage or a, or, a, or a romantic connection or a deep friendship for you to say, no, I am not going back to that version of me. And if they're not upgrading at the same time, mm -hmm. then it is an awkward situation for sure. You know, if I want to grow in this, or maybe I want to move past some of this anxiety and a desire to go deeper in the relationships that I have. You know, journaling has been a big thing for me or your, you know, whatever you, your version of that is, guys. So what I would do is I would journal. This is what Paul is like when he's anxious. And I would journal my behavior, wouldn't tell anybody. Some of it was very nuanced. No one would perhaps have spotted, but I knew the energy I felt, the fear, um, the hesitancy, the insecurity. I would try and journal that and ask myself, was it valid? When did it, when did it flow? When did it ebb? What kind of people made me feel that way? To try and find a pattern. If you can perceive a pattern, I think, on this stuff, Les, you can see your anxiety rather than as individual situations, but a pattern that suddenly has a narrative to it. I felt my anxiety had a narrative to it that I've just articulated to you of my parenting and what that did to me. I didn't know it back then, how it moved me into this attachment with people that were leaders in the church, how that made me vulnerable to be taken advantage of. I saw a narrative then to how this anxiety in me about relationship and attachment forced me into relationships that always made me vulnerable and never gave a good outcome if things went a certain way. And I didn't like it. So, when I reinvented the church and so many people left and my anxiety was going off the charts, I realized, okay, this is literally going to kill me. It's going to make me sick before it kills me, but it's going to affect my health and well-being. I'm going to age 20 years here in the next six months, et cetera, et cetera. So I began to do the work, the effort required internally, I think, to track the anxiety and try to minimize it and then a few people that I felt very safe with, and it's never more than that for any of us, I felt confident to talk to, it, talk to them about it without the language of this book, but to try and help them help me and me help them with our ver varieties of this back then is all you can do. So I don't know if there's any hacks other than, like you just said, being aware of it. And the book is good to give you language for it and think, okay, I, I see myself in that example in the book. I have been like that in a relationship. I was like that with a girl or a guy. I'm like that in my marriage or whatever. I, li I like that language because it so describes why they dumped me, why I got fired, why I didn't get promoted, 
why they didn't call me back, why they ghosted me even. I think it's that that I think the book could be helpful in, and I found it helpful. Secure in who you are. You you guys know it's a big thing for me, um, and I guess for you guys to to be comfortable in your own skin, to know who you are, to not be someone else's version of you um, because everybody else has an idea of who they think you should be and if they can't let go of that they will not stay in your life that's why I become avoidant I'm avoidant I become avoidant of people that are trying to make me their version of them so I think as Kane said for me my primary work for the last 20 years especially has been to hell with whatever you think I should be I am going to be me I'm going to be, I'm going to do that well. I'm going to be the best version of me. And I know however well I do it in any given day, someone's going to hate it. But I'm still not going to change it. I'm still not going to adjust it. Because I know I have done a lot of work to become this version of me. So I'm not going to let you tell me I'm intimidating. You're intimidated. So you need the work, not me. I would never have said that to someone years ago because it seems rude and dismissive and unkind. But to be secure in who you are as a person enables you to say, um, I don't think so. I think you've got work to do. And I've done that around the world now for 20 years. And i got to tell you, I can see how the room's divided instantly when I respond in a way, answer a question in a way that is from my secure version of me. But people in the room that are not secure have a heart attack. People say to me, I can't believe you just said that. It's like the Simon Cowell effect. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode by Paul Scanlon. Why not share with him your thoughts on this particular episode at Paul Scanlon UK by sending him a DM or tagging him in a post. And don't forget to check out the mentorshipgroup.com to find out how you can be a part of this global community. Thank you again for listening.